all of that. Well, they just can't stand me because I'm saved. No, they can't stand you because of what you did. Because of what you said. Well, I thought that my salvation would clear all of that. No, the salvation cleared your sin. Your participation in it, that cleared that. Your stand before God. But if we still reap, just like Paul did. Notice, Paul got, and he got back way more than what he put out. My Lord. I wish I could put this teaching in a nice, neat little package to explain why some people get healed and delivered and some don't. I can't. All I can do is offer this example of what happened in the life of one of our champions in the Christian faith. He persecuted believers. He imprisoned them. He caused a lot of suffering and heartache and even many believers to get executed. He sold these things. He reaped exactly what he sold and God didn't change it. God just gave him the grace to go through it and to deal with his harvest. Many believers are in the same position as Paul. They did a lot of dirt. They caused a lot of hurt. They sold a lot of bad seeds before they got saved. However, you may have thought that because your sin was covered, that your seeds were canceled. But God did not cancel your harvest. He canceled your debt. He didn't cancel your harvest. He canceled your debt. So that you would not end up being eternally separated from him. However, you and I must still deal with the stuff that we sold. So you and I don't have to, we don't have the right to be angry with God for not taking away the consequences of our bad seeds. We must respond like Paul and say, I will boast in my infirmities. I will boast in my weakness. We have to be honest and transparent about how we got to where we are right now. Tell yourself the truth. That's a phrase that we, t me and my wife used to tell our children. Because uh, when they're playing outside, and as children do, one or the other, somebody's always going to come in the house mad and saying, they won't play with me. Nobody likes me. Nobody will play with me. And so we stopped one of them. I forgot which one it was and, and said, no, is it that nobody will play with you or is it that you don't want to play what they are playing? Tell yourself the truth. Otherwise, you have this kid growing up. Feeling, nobody likes me. And actually, you just don't want to play with everybody else. Tell yourself the truth. Can you imagine saying that to little kids? But we did. Seven and eight and nine years old. We're telling our sons, tell yourself the truth. Because I refuse to let them grow up with this mentality that they're the victim and everybody hates them. No, tell yourself the truth. If you don't want to play what all of the other kids are already playing, you can't make all the other kids change to you. And then say, nobody likes me. Say amen. <laughs> and there are many children, I'm telling you, running up and down the streets of Harrisburg and they've taken on that attitude. Nobody wants to play with me. No, you don't want to play what everybody else is playing. I know that's not the case all the time, but most of the time that is with kids. You just don't want to play what they're playing. So be honest. Now here we are as adults and we still do the same thing. We take on the same mentality as adults, especially in churches. Choir director says we're going to sing this song. Everybody's in agreement. One person says, I don't I don't feel like led that we should sing that song. Then because they don't sing that song on that Sunday, this person drops out the praise team. This whole, the whole team is against me. No, they ain't. You are rebellious. Tell yourself the truth. See, and then they sow the seed. They sowed that seed of division, discord, and then they get upset. And they come back to the praise team. Don't nobody really want to talk to them. 
Well, no, I'm not excusing the praise team from responding like that, but you sold that. You're going to reap that. See, the devil just, he just messing up the, no, that ain't the devil. You. You didn't want to submit and go along with what the leader said we're going to do. You created division. When you go back, the division is still there. Yes, people have an attitude about you. Not an angry attitude, but they're going to be cautious now because they don't know where you are. But the enemy's telling you, this is the devil. The Lord has given me a test. No, no, no. You sold. And now you're reaping what you sold. Anybody receiving wisdom today? Come on, say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So to have to tell ourselves the truth. This is not a test. It could be my reaping day. And now I must humble myself and receive the grace. That's what Paul had to do. He had to humble himself and receive the grace to live with it and to go through it. Now, the reason it's so important to receive this teaching today is because it takes away another illegal intrusion of the enemy that accuses God. That's my whole point of saying all of this today. It's taking away that thought that accuses God of not changing my situation. It's taking away the accusation against God. I even hate it on insurance forms when I see stuff like tornadoes and earthquakes and everything listed as an act of God. I'm taking away the accusations against God today. This wisdom, this understanding. Remember, we talked about wisdom last week from James about the wisdom that descends from above versus the wisdom that's earthly or sensual or demonic. This is the wisdom that descends from God. It's not based upon natural feeling. It's not based upon a natural way of thinking. And it certainly isn't based upon demonic wisdom. This is the word of God, God's perspective. When you think of the word, when you think of wisdom coming from God, what we're talking about is what is God's perspective about what is happening in our lives? From his perspective, he's looking at the stuff that we sowed a long time ago and now we're reaping it. And then we call it a test from him and we call it an attack from the devil and and sometimes it can be an attack from the devil, just like it was with the Apostle Paul. And then you wonder what God, why are you letting the enemy come up against me like this? And you look at Paul's life and you see it clearly because you sold this. And now you're reaping this. But the answer is the same. My grace is sufficient. Now, this kind of revelation can be overwhelming. I don't want you to get depressed. Oh, my God, how much stuff do I have to read? Ah! <laughs> oh, my God. Before the room descends into the abyss of depression. <laughs> Here is the word of the Lord, especially if you've done something that has a high price tag when reaping day comes. If you've done something, you know it has a high price tag. This word can be very overwhelming. But Pastor Chris has to give this word. Those in the room, I really feel this, especially for somebody that's watching this online, even if it's not so much for you guys here in the room. There's somebody online that's got to have this. Um, if you've done stuff that's got a high price tag and you're afraid of reaping day coming, uh, I didn't say all of this to panic, put you in a panic and to disturb you. But I said this to kind of shake you into the reality into the reality that this isn't something God did to you. It's not even just an attack of the enemy, even though he does take advantage of these kinds of things to attack us. But to bring us into this mature understanding that Paul walked in and said, God said, my grace is sufficient. Then I received the grace. The psalmist said it like this. You know, you know, I don't want you to be overwhelmed by this reality of reaping what you have sown. Uh, I want to talk to you about the grace that God gives when we're, when we're overwhelmed like this. From Psalm 61, it says, Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry 
to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. I strongly encourage you to call out uh, to call out to God for grace and mercy when reaping day comes. This is an incredible reaping day prayer. If you allow me to say it that way, when my heart is overwhelmed, God, lead me to the rock that's higher than me. I come to you. I receive the grace, the strength. Now, I want to close this word. To help us to see or to take back that reaping day access pass. Last week, I told you I would come back to this particular scripture. Uh, from Psalm 1, when we first started here in Harrisburg, this was our, our, we made this the theme for our church when we first got started here. It says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers to take back that access pass. <laughs> all those passes in in this area of our lives where we have lived with unanswered questions and frustration about things that seemingly just don't change. We must understand what it means to walk in the counsel of the wicked to stand in the way of sinners or to sit in the seat of mockers. Walking in the counsel of the wicked means living and ordering your life in the same view, the same opinions, the same judgments and advice of those who don't have a relationship with God. You order your life the same way. You think of life the same way. You plan your life the same way. Standing in the way of sinners means don't stand in the way of sinners means don't try to establish yourself or repair yourself. I didn't know these definitions were in there. Don't try to fix it yourself. Raise up yourself. Or endure in the same manner of life of unrighteous or wicked people. In other words, you see things going wrong. I'm going to fix it myself. I'm going to straighten it out myself. I'm going to pick myself up by my own bootstraps. Because the, don't, the, don't it say somewhere in the Bible that the Lord helps those who help themselves? No. <laughs> no, it don't say that. It's living in that I can do it. I do it myself. I do it myself. See, that's pride. Can't take no advice or nothing from nobody else. No, nah, I do it myself. Sitting in the seat of the scornful, and this is a really tough one. It means to take a position of authority of importance. That's the sitting part. It means to take a position of importance, of, of authority and importance. It means taking a place of judging making determinations and decisions like scornful people do. Well, now you got to look at what are scornful people. Scornful is the act of expressing contempt for others. It means to deride. It means to laugh at or to make fun of people. It means to ridicule them. The act of making someone or something the object of laughter, joking or mocking. Having contempt means the feeling or the action uh, of a person toward another person that considers that other person lower than you, worthless or beneath you. It's the act of showing disrespect for the authority or dignity that God gives another person. And here's how you show the disrespect by disobedience and by unruliness. Sounds like all of America, don't it? <laughs> so to sit in the seat of the scornful is, to, is, is really, I would say, one of the prominent attitudes in, of our nation today. In fact, you can make 
all kinds of, the, uh, I think on, on the, some of the sitcoms and the movies, the most popular character is the person who is like this. The one who is really good at demeaning everybody else, talking down on everybody else. In fact, we exalt those characters. We love that person who can really spin out those great jokes that's just cutting down everybody all around them. So we think of this seat as a, as a seat of importance. But it's the seat of the scornful. Sometimes we use the word scoffer. And this word is used because a scoffer is one who mocks who shows contempt by mocking or sneering. Unlike the good man who walks the path of wisdom, the scoffer, listen to this, the scoffer is a person who follows the path of foolishness, refusing to listen to the wisdom of others. So the one who sits in the seat of the scornful, not only are they contemptuous of other people, but they refuse even to listen to the wisdom of others. So instead, we are encouraged to have our delight or pleasure in the standard of God's word, in the law. And this particular word that was used for law is precept. I'll talk about that in just a second. Delight means to consider something of great value. Mom and I were just talking about a little bit earlier today about this generation uh, here in America and in the church in America that does not value the word of God and the presence of God. The world is more important. The world is more valuable. That's the priority. For many, it's a a difficult thing for me to grasp. Here's the reason why it's hard for me to grasp, because even if I was not a pastor, and before I was a pastor, and before I even knew I was going to become a pastor, my wife and I had lived this life of trying to figure out why things didn't turn around. And before we even knew we was going to be in the ministry, we made a deliberate and intentional decision that we're going to go after this. All at, at the point that we were in our lives at the time, everything had fallen apart. My brother was starting the church, and so we just decided we're going to give it our all. We're going to come back and really do the things of God, and we're going to help my brother. I ain't know I was going to end up being called into the ministry. So I'm saying this to you, understand, I didn't start living this way because I was a pastor. Didn't know that was going to happen. I just wanted God. I wanted the pattern to stop. That's all we wanted. We wanted to get break out of the pattern of the poverty, the cycle of the pain, the cycle of failure. I wanted to get out of it. And the only thing, the only thing that came to an opportunity was dropped in our lap. My brother's come move back to St. Louis. He needs help to get the ministry going. Here it is right here. I can, can now continue in the cycle to try to take care of myself. Raise up myself, repair myself or submit. Submit. Here is God. It just happened to be my blood brother. But we saw it as this is God speaking to us. The moment has come. Here is your opportunity. You can break the cycle by submitting to God, making him and what he wants priority of our lives. Or if we can just keep on trying to make it work, make it work. But we had to see the value. The value wasn't in my brother. The value wasn't in the ministry. The value was in God and his word. I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you, this is what we did. So like a commercial, I'm saying, I encourage you, do what we did. Make God and his word the priority of your life. You will not be disappointed. I know I sound like a commercial now, but I'm selling you on him, not on us. I'm just telling you what we did, but don't look at us for the reason why you do it. I'm just telling you what we did. God, you, you will be the priority. No matter how we feel, yeah, we're going out there and meet with your people. Well, how, what we're going through, uh, we're going to pray. We, we participated in the fast, didn't we? Oh, my God. We was in the fastings, the prayers. We drug our kids out there to the, to the, uh, to the uh, weekend prayers and fasting. We just wanted God. We didn't know 
then it was going to lead to us getting called into the ministry. I'm not telling you going to get called into the ministry if you do this, but I am telling you the cycle will be broken. Some of you, you read our story. That's why we took the time to even write it. But we we kind of hid our story in a marriage book. Because the real story of that little marriage book out there is really about committing your whole heart and your whole life to the Lord. Holding nothing back in reserve and watching him not disappoint you. You will not be disappointed. Thank you, Lord. Come on, bless the Lord today. You won't be disappointed. To meditate on his word means to murmur or to mutter something over and over. Like, remember when you used to study for those exams and you read it and keep muttering it? Because you wanted to remember it. You wanted to get it locked in your mind. That's how he's talking about really getting into his word. Now, I mentioned that that word for law in that scripture is precept. And a precept is close in meaning to the word prescription. A prescription, as we all know, if you go to the doctor, they will give you an exam, give you a thorough examination. And then based upon what they find, the doctor's going to write out a prescription. Sometimes this prescription is medication. Sometimes it's a regimen. Sometimes it's, it'll mention diet, but it's this is what's prescribed for you in order to heal this condition. That's what this word for precept is. This word for law is it's precept. So when the word of God is talking about meditating on the law, the word, he's saying meditate on the prescription that he gave you. He didn't look at you. Use your imagination. God then laid us down on the examination table. He don't need no x-ray machine. He can just look, beep, beep, see everything. <laughs> everything in our heart, in our lives, in our past, in our present, in our future. And then he writes out a prescription and he says, take this, do this, follow this diet, follow this regimen each and every day. It may be tough. It's going to feel restrictive. There's some things you have to cut out of your diet. There's some things you have to stop watching and entertaining. But it's your prescription. Do you want to be healed? Do you want it to change? Then here's my prescription. He's saying, if you meditate, remember that prescription. Remember the prescription. Meditate on the prescription day and night. Isn't this awesome to see that, everybody? If you do it, there's healing that's coming. Precept is not just a set of rules to obey. That's why many people have struggled with words like this. In, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law. He meditates. See, all we hear is law. <laughs> but his delight is in the prescription of the Lord. And on his prescription, he mutters and memorizes it and meditates day and night. Doesn't that change all of it? And it's not just a set of rules that is disconnected to what's going on in my life. That's why many people struggle with the Bible. And when they hear the word law associated to God, because it just sounds like a set of rules. We we live here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the state capital where we're just bombarded with laws and rules and regulations and fees. And no matter what you're doing, there's somebody ready to get you. I was just driving through downtown one time. It was a rainy morning and and the cops stopped me and said, your headlights are not on. Ooh, my headlights. Are, yes. When it's raining and you have your wipers on, then the law requires that your headlights are on. I'm, like, I'm thinking, really? Really? <laughs> of course, I couldn't say it, but it's like you ain't got nothing to do. If you got time to stop somebody and it's raining outside, my wipers are going, but my headlights are not on. But that's Harrisburg, laws and rules and regulations. So when you come to church and you hear more about laws and rules and like, oh, God, oh, Lord. So that's why I have to separate it from, no, he's not just talking about laws and rules and regulations that got nothing to do with real life. 
Now, in that case with me on those headlights, I thought, because I got one of those cars, and many of us do, where your lights come on automatically. So I'm just a cloudy day. I get up and do what I've always done. You get up and you drive to work. So I didn't know that my lights hadn't kicked on. I thought it was, I wasn't even thinking about it. Because most of us know if it's dark enough on a cloudy day, your lights will come on. So we live in a world where stuff, you ain't even thinking about it. What am I getting at? Because we live in a city and we live in a time where so many laws and rules and regulations, you can't even keep up with all this stuff. You come to church and hear about more laws and rules. It's like, is there any consideration when this law was written about everyday life and situations? Did you consider before you came up to stop me that perhaps my automatic light thing didn't come on? But because you're so set on the rules and the regulations, you didn't even consider the law in my situation. Well, that's what a prescription is. It's a consideration of the law for your situation. Woo, come on, bless the Lord. God didn't just come up with a bunch of rules to lay on you. First, he looked at me and you. He saw our condition. Then he wrote the prescription based upon my condition and what I'm going through. So it was very personal. That's why when you read the word of God, it hits you in such a personal way. It is the law. Yes, it is the word. Yes, but it's applying. It's being applied to my situation. Now you can see why the writer would say his delight, my pleasure is in the prescription of God. I love your memory. Remember, remember, you've read the psalm and said, I love your prescriptions, Lord. Yeah, why does he love it? Is this some super Christian that just loves going around trying to fulfill 600 plus laws? No, because God, you looked at my life. You looked at exactly what I'm going through in my makeup. You looked at my family line and stuff I've done. You looked at the bad seeds I sowed. And you know stuff I got to reap on reaping day. You looked at the attacks of the enemy. You looked at my handicaps, my disabilities. God, you looked at the stuff that even I perpetrated and I did wrong. And you wrote a prescription for me, tailor-made for me. Come on, somebody bless the Lord today. It was for me. Thank you, Lord. So that's what the day has been about. It's been another precept, a prescription for our healing. So why did Pastor Chris say all of this stuff that I've said today about reaping day? And that's because I wanted to attach it to this word. Even for reaping day. This is helping you so that you're not overwhelmed by reaping day. Now you see why Paul could receive this word. The prescription. Thank you, Lord. The prescription for praying three times. God, change this. Change this. The prescription came directly from God. My grace is enough. My grace is enough. Even though you're reaping what you sowed, I'm going to cause I'm going to cause powerful revelation to come through your life that people thousands of years in the future are going to reap the benefit out of what comes out of you in the midst of this suffering. So there's some stuff that, yeah, you're going through. God's not going to change it, but it's because you're children and your grandchildren and your great grandchildren and friends and family and loved ones and folks that you may never even meet will reap the benefit of the power of God coming through your life, of the grace of God coming through your life. Come on, just receive that right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So you don't have to pray another day and say, God, please change it. Just change, just change your prayer and say, Lord, I receive your grace. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Let your will be done through me. Let your will be done in my life, through my life. Thank you, Lord. Your grace is enough. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Let's just close with this prayer that we've been praying. It goes like this. Recognizing that my fight is not against flesh and blood. Come on, pray with me. Political parties, activist groups, or social movements. I stand here in the gap for my family with the spiritual weapons of prayer, praise, worship, and the word of God, I declare that I am not afraid of spiritual enemies. I remember the Lord, great and awesome, as I fight for my brothers and sisters, my sons and daughters, my spouse and my household. According to the promise in Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against us will prosper. And every tongue that accuses us in judgment, we will condemn. This is the heritage of the service of the Lord, and our vindication is from the Lord. So, Father, I, Father God, I'm sorry, I receive your grace, favor, protection, and wisdom. And I thank you for giving your angels charge over me and my family to keep us in all our ways. Amen. Amen. Come on, bless the Lord right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we do in this very moment, we take back that access pass that we handed over to the enemy. You can say that right where you are. I take it back. That pass that I handed him because I was mad. I was disappointed with you, God, because you didn't change this situation. I see it now. You're working a greater plan. Your prescription for me is to allow your grace to be enough for me. Thank you, Lord. You know, sometimes we've sung these powerful songs, these scriptural songs, and we didn't know the background out of which it came. I remember during the 80s and 90s, we used to sing this one particular song. It was a Jehovah Jireh, my providers, his grace is sufficient for me. And we were just singing, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for his grace is sufficient for me. And then when God allowed us to be in situations where we needed his grace to be sufficient, I bind this, I stop this in the name of Jesus. No, this is the Lord allowing his grace <laughs> to be sufficient. Why is Pastor Chris saying this? Because I want you to walk away from these sessions and these meetings each week with real, real answers from God about what you're going through in everyday life. I'm not putting down the television preachers because I don't know their story and their journey and how they got to where they are. Many of them suffered many things. And sometimes the people who produce their television shows, they don't show the parts of their sermons and their testimonies where they're talking like I'm talking now. Uh, it's not that they never say it, they just never put it on the air so that people like me and you can hear the other side of the story. I'm thankful for the glorious victories and the powerful times when God comes through just in the nick of time. But I don't know about you, but I, me and my wife have lived through some, there were no nick of time rescues. We went through. We went through. And when I stop and ask God why, the answers would come back like this. My grace is sufficient. Or this is what you sold. This was your contribution to the situation of why you are where you are. That's so necessary because now, because from that point, we could move forward. And one of the most important things about it is that it keeps us from doing it again. It breaks the cycle. If I know what I did wrong, I'm just one of those people. If you tell me what I did wrong, I'm going to make sure I don't do that again. I know that there are some people, they're hard headed and they'll just keep right on bumping that, you know, just. They're just like the little toy that just they, they don't never. I'm one of those one, one time. Uh, I'm done. I gotta just tell me how I ended up there. <laughs> Once you tell me, I ain't doing that no more. And so these kinds of words are coming so that we can be free. Aren't you glad for the prescription? Thank you, Lord. God bless you guys. Thank you, Lord.
Have an awesome, awesome week this week. Those of you that are watching online, God bless you guys. See you next week. Bless the Lord, everybody.